Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. It's Thursday morning. Um, we've had. You, we, by the way, just a beautiful day here in West Virginia. Uh, it's it's it was like fifty seven degrees or something when I got up this morning. It's going to be sunny and a beautiful day, probably in the low seventies. Bill, are you just cruelly twisting the knife in New Orleans and the New York City? <laughs> Every place ravaged by natural disaster. Like, hey, West Virginia, inland, <laughs> away from extreme weather. It's all good here. Well, no, we had you know we had major rains yesterday uh, from Ida, um, and there was flash flood warnings in effect, and uh, there's always the chance that the river could rise and all that. But uh, here today, in the aftermath, it's amazing. It's beautiful, fall like, autumn like. Uh, I, I, this is sacrilegious for a New Englander to say, but I do feel the best foliage I have seen is in West Virginia. So I'm. I don't know when it, I don't know when your season is, but I imagine it's coming up soon. If you're looking for a little socially distanced vacay, I would certainly recommend West Virginia in the fall. Uh, don't come here. No, <laughs> it's bad. Uh, there's nothing to see, and it's just yeah. No, go 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 to Massachusetts, people. <laughs> you you you're a West Virginia resident for what six months, <laughs> and now <laughs> transplants, gentrifiers, get out. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's not worth seeing. You don't want to come here. No. <laughs> um, so we had breaking news this morning uh, in Texas uh, with the Supreme Court uh, voting on uh, a request for an emergency stay of Texas' new anti-abortion law, 5-4, saying let the law proceed and be implemented, claiming that they're not adjudicating the constitutionality of it, saying that it's such a novel, complex law, they need to wait before casting judgment on it. Of course, you could, so it's, it's a bit of an obtuse and maybe even disingenuous argument because you could have a stay <laughs> and then adjudicate the constitutionality, constitutionality of it down the road, but they chose not to do that. Um, is this... You know, is there singing in the land uh, in the pro-life uh, conservative uh, part of the country today? Well, I don't know about that. Um, <clears throat> as I know, you know, as I've as I noted uh, a while ago, I mean, I think that that there's probably I, I think the chances of the Supreme Court, you know, basically overturning Roe versus Wade are, are higher than people think. Um, and so, but I think that that, um, that that will, there will be, I mean, there, there would be a backlash if that happens. And so, and it's going to be just an incredibly, um, uh, difficult, uh, intense fight over this, just what we need another culture war, you know, issue, right. As if, you know, well, Afghanistan and hurricanes aren't exactly cultural war issues, but we got a lot going on. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure that people are like, uh, bring it on, but, you know, this is why we got in, this is why a lot of us got involved in politics. Um, and this is a, something a lot of people believe in. Um, so I, I can just tell you my personal thought is, as someone who, I'm not the kind of person who like relishes fighting uh, over hot button things, but I think this is going to, I think this is coming to a head. Um, and this, you know, this seems like it might be just like another data point on the way to something that's probably going to happen about a year from now. Well, you know, I have, I have a piece in the queue at the Washington monthly. It's not up uh, quite yet. And I, and I had to, you know, tweak it you know, after the news, the overnight news. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's, there's two possible scenarios here, in my opinion. One is there are five Supreme Court justices that are absolutely prepared uh, to overturn or s significantly gut row come June with the Mississippi 
15 week abortion case. Uh, and this five, four vote on the, on the stay is just an example of them laying their cards on, on the table. Uh, and if that is the case, then, you know, there's nothing anybody can do in the, in the, in the near term. They're just going to do it. You, there's no convincing them. Uh, I think there is another possible scenario. Of course, I can't, can't be a mind reader, uh, that there aren't five firmly committed to do it yet, even though there might be five inclined, they aren't all the way there. Uh, and allowing this Texas law to go forward is dipping the toe in the water. Let's see how, uh, uh, how, how this plays out, how chaotic it is, how controversial it is, how, how much backlash there is. Because, I mean, either you want to overturn Roe because you think it is, uh, it's, Roe is a constitutional abomination, and who cares about the politics, who cares about the backlash, if it's wrong, it's wrong, and we're just going to overturn it. Or, if you have some respect for precedent and some concern about the overall legitimacy of the court, you know, politics might enter into your thinking and say, look, if I overturn Roe v. Wade, and the backlash is so severe that Democrats are going to be able to pack the court and and fundamentally undermine legitimacy forevermore, uh, maybe that's not worth it. Uh, and so let's see how Texas plays out before making that determination. So my counsel is to progressives, to those who, who are who are pro-choice, you know, you got to make noise now. You have to do everything possible to show uh, how bad this will be other, if, if you if, if everyone goes into the attitude of, of shrugging your shoulders and say, yeah, you know, there, no, nothing, uh, there's there's no there's no stopping this freight train, or I, I'm having some arguments with people on Twitter already that Democrats are just trying to pass a law in Congress, uh, eliminate the filibuster and pass a law because the court's a hopeless is, is a hopeless cause. Uh, I I think if you go down that path, you increase the odds the court will take that step. Uh, and I think that could lead to, I think that could lead to a severe undermining of the court's legitimacy and a pillar of, you know, constitutional democracy. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is probably not great, uh, salesmanship, uh, to promote our, to promote what we do here, but I'm anxiously awaiting the, uh, advisory opinions podcast with Sarah Isger and David French, um, because their expertise is talking about the, um, you know, the legal nuances that, that you and I are. Bill, I'll, I'll go there with the Afghanistan thing. Like, <laughs> I'm not an expert on this. Um, but uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing their take, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, which should drop later today. I hope we're taping mm -hmm. this on Thursday morning, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with that. Um, two things. One, um, so I think is there are four Supreme Court justices who have to agree to take up something to take a case. So the Mississippi case, a case. I mean, there's a Mississippi case. It's a 15 week abortion ban. Back in May, the court decided to take that case, hear oral, oral arguments in the coming term, which starts in October, likely ruling on that case late June, early July when the term ends. So only it takes four to take the case. Doesn't tell you if there's five to. Uh, concur with Mississippi. Uh, so the assumption is that there were four conservatives who chose to take the case. At minimum. Which suggests, at least, right? Um, do we know, I, I, don't, I don't know if we know how many actually voted, but but I think the, the insinuation is that you would not vote to take on the case unless you were inclined to uh, take the pro-life position on yeah, the case. I mean, if, if, I mean, the lower court already said the Mississippi law was unconstitutional. So the pro-choice thing is to say, let, let it lie. We don't need to rule on this. This is already a clear decision by the lower court based on existing precedent. You only take the case if you want to overturn the precedent. Yeah. Uh, um, and now presume... one, one, one sort of caveat is that John Roberts in the past has what I believe he has made the wrong ruling. So, for example, on Obamacare, mm -hmm. I believe that Roberts knew Obamacare was unconstitutional, but 
reverse engineered a theory to uphold it because he thought the greater good of the legitimacy of the court and comity uh, would be served by that decision. Now, I, I don't think that's the role of a judge to factor that in, but that was my take. And uh, there's a chance maybe he would do that again. Now, the problem, though, is we have another we, we now have Amy Coney Barrett replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right. And so even if John Roberts um, did not support the pro-life uh, decision, you could still have a 5-4. Is that right, Bill? Right. I mean, so I think, you know, Gorsuch, Alito, Thomas, you know, you know, 99.99 percent. I mean, I think Thomas even said flat out Roe is wrong. Uh, Gorsuch wrote an opinion. We've lost our way uh, on abortion. Um, you know, and Coney Barrett, you know, you mean maybe she's like 99.98 there. Um, but I think there's a little bit more in her pre Supreme Court writings, uh, even though she's certainly someone who has written that there's, um, that she's not tightly wedded to precedent, that she has some, uh, some recognition of the importance of precedent. So yeah. maybe she would do a political thing here, but I was ne nothing in her rulings as justice have shown that flexibility on abortion, what, what limited opportunity she's had. Kavanaugh, there was a big profile of Kavanaugh by McKay Coppins in the Atlantic not too long <clears> ago, <throat> which, you know, painted more as an enigma. People have, you know, opposite views on where he would go on this. Seems a little disinclined to culture work. Kind of a Matt Lewis. You know, definitely, definitely pro-life, definitely anti-abortion, but really doesn't like the confrontation. And so it, when put in the hot seat here, you're not quite sure what he's going to do. Uh, now, he voted with the majority in this on this Texas stay. Um, and so the question then, be, and, and Roberts didn't. Um, now, I think the Roberts reasoning... And, and by the way, let me just say, everyone that I've heard who knows Kavanaugh is very confident that he will um, be pro-life mm -hmm. when, you know, that, that and, and the other point too, Bill is, I mean, look again, I need to, <laughs> every time this issue comes up, I need to do like another, I'm not a lawyer. So I have to do like refresh my memory <laughs> on stuff. But I mean, like, you know, Roe was based on kind of an invented, notion of the right to privacy. Well, right. In, and as in, I recall, in, in the conservative telling, <laughs> well, there's no, I mean, it's not in the constitution. I mean, so you, you, you started Griswold v. Connecticut, which was about, you know, married couples and contraception. Uh, that was the first decision that said you take various parts of the constitution, the bill of rights, and you put them together. And that creates a penumbra, uh, that, uh, speaks to a, a, a right to privacy. And as right. I recall, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had, and other progressives had, had publicly said that they, they're pro-abortion rights, but they think that Roe was like wrongly decided. Or you that know, the Ginsburg articulated a different um, philosophical rationale for a right to abortion that was not, the, not Roe's rationale. And then there's the Casey decision in yeah. 92, yeah. which established different things, including like viability. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess my point is, even if you are, <clears throat> even if you're strongly philosophically pro-choice, there's not, it's, there's not a solid, there's, the legal foundation that this all rests on is very shaky. That's why you have to talk about precedent, Bill. That's mm -hmm. why precedent kind of becomes the thing mm -hmm. because the the actual foundation is really shaky. Like even mm -hmm. if you're even if you think that that pro choice is is the right thing, mm -hmm. you kind of have to concede that the foundation is is not rock solid. I mean, these are subjective terms, but I could say that. 
DC versus Heller is shaky because it's only been a few years old and it's not, and there wasn't a whole lot of constitutional um, Supreme Court opinions along those True. lines in the 200 years but, prior. But there is a Second Amendment. I mean, there is a right to bear arms. There Wait, is but not. It's a, it's a very convolutedly worded amendment that okay. people interpret differently. We can. I can say the Second Amendment yeah. is a shaky amendment because it's so poorly okay, worded. I agree. <laughs> Look, what, what's a, what is a well armed militia? Okay. <laughs> but at least there is a right to bear arms. It's the Second Amendment. There is no right to an abortion in the Constitution. And so, you know. Well, before we go too deep down, you know, the broader <laughs> constitutional debate here, um, let's, let's get back to what the, these justices are, are, are potentially thinking. Um, you know, Roberts's argument, his dissent in this Texas stay, he said, uh, the state legislature imposed, quote, a prohibition on abortions after roughly six weeks, then, quote, essentially delegate enforcement of that prohibition to the populace at large. So, so as people might now know, the way the Texas law is structured, it, it doesn't give public officials any enforcement authority. It deputizes any citizen to sue any, any abortion provider, anyone helping someone getting an abortion. So even like a cab driver driving you to the clinic. Uh, an insurance company paying the insurance claim. Uh, so you you can sue from anywhere in the country, and if you win, you get ten grand in your legal costs covered. And if and if the defendants win, they get nothing. So it's heavily skewed towards encouraging people to sue uh, abortion providers. Yeah, which is an interesting thing, right? I mean, traditionally conservatives have not been. The litigious <laughs> side, right? Well, in the, we, well, in, the, in the Trumpian party, that that that, that view might yeah. have been, might have shifted. But you know, I think Roberts has a pretty long-standing animosity towards getting cute with the law. I think he doesn't like these clever plays that he, that he, they feel sort of manifestly disingenuous. Um, and so, like when when uh, I think when Trump did some cute stuff, he was like, "Look, kid, you know, that's this is let, let, let's be commonsensical here, you know." You and he, here in Texas, he seems like, "Look, you guys didn't have the the, the moxie to actually own responsibility for your own law." Um, that doesn't fly with me, when, which is sort of separate from you know is Roe v. Wade you know accurately decided or not. Uh, so that just sort of says to me he's not inclined to uphold this law when it's fully reviewed. And so my, my question to you is, Matt, are there, is, are there any conservatives outside of John Roberts saying, look, I want to get rid of Roe, I want to get rid of Casey, uh, but this whole sue everybody thing, you know, that kind of violates my innate conservativeness. Is there anybody out there like that? Um, I haven't heard yet. I mean, I think it's too it's too soon to say, um, you know, like I was just listening to you know, a podcast with, uh, is it David Jolly and, uh, and Charlie Sykes at the Bulwark? And they were sort of saying some of those things, or at least implying it. Um, <clears throat> maybe not that, that that was a deal breaker for them, but that it raised questions, you know, about if this is kind of the right thing to do. But, um, you know, I think you've got two things going on here. I think you've got the Trump era, which is about owning the libs and, it, the ends justify the means. <clears throat> and then I think you've got the fact that this issue is, again, the reason that like so many of us got involved in politics. Um, and it's just such a uh, defining issue for a pro-life movement that predates Donald Trump by, by a long time. Um, and so I don't suspect you're going to have a lot of people who are uh, a lot of conservatives who are pro-life, strongly pro-life, who are um, quibbling over uh, the way that they're going about this, is my I, guess. I just, I, I find the approach strange. I mean, because look, you got a 6-3 court. <laughs> you got a court pretty predisposed to the anti-abortion, anti row way of thinking. And it seems like at the state level, there's a there's a lack of patience. Yeah. Uh, so you already had this Mississippi case in the queue. They've already taken the case. It's a pretty audacious case <laughs> to go 
to 15 weeks, I mean, it's, it's directly in defiance of Casey. It's in defiance of the viability standard. And if you win that case, that's moving the ball way down the field. Uh, and instead of sort of letting that, let's just see what happens there. You now have Texas and other states pushing these fetal heartbeat bans, which, which are roughly six week ban. Uh, and so you're at a point where, I mean, many people don't even know they are pregnant, uh, at that point. Cause it's not, it's not even six weeks after conception. It's six, it's six weeks after, you know, your last, uh, period. Uh, so, uh, and now you have Texas's law being put in place before I mean, Mississippi's law is not in place. And so the court could rule on Mississippi in in sort of a, a could have in a calmer space, but now they're going to make that ruling after Texas is in effect for nearly a year, uh, and I mean I think it could when when there's there's a risk from the from the pro life perspective risk that's going to make the Supreme Court flinch and not uh, do what they want in Mississippi, and two you know if they go forward on that. Uh, the, the backlash on the left is already cranking up and could well make it hard for Republicans to win the midterms. If you have an animated democratic base. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I wrote a daily beast piece when the Mississippi thing came down, making the point that like that, you know, no one is talking about the potential for a Supreme court decision on abortion which would happen theoretically right before the midterms. Right. This is June or July 2022, you know, right. literally four months before the midterm. And so, you know, uh, nobody, I haven't heard anybody else <clears throat> factor in this issue as a potential for changing the trajectory, which everybody assumes that Republicans are easily going to take, certainly the House. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, Bill, I guess it's just a, it, it, this goes back to kind of an age old question about activism, which is, is it prudent to stake out a um, very defensible position that is really hard to argue with <clears throat> um, on pro-life for, or is the Overton window better? Like, is it is it better for these states to really try to push the Overton window, um, you know, for, farther to the right, like which of those two options is 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 going to result in more pro-life policies? I mean, I would think, I mean, because clearly the, the objective for the pro-life movement is not to end up at some sort of middle ground. They want to get rid of they want to get rid of abortion. Period. Um, they want to convince people. They, 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 it requires a degree of persuasion. Uh, which I think they are not so keen on doing that spade work on. They just want to, they just want to get it and push through whatever they can push through whenever they can. Um, hold on one second, Matt. I'm getting a poor connection message on my Skype. <clears throat> uh, now that went away. Um, I mean, as you know, Bill, I, I think my, you know, just sort of temperamentally and strategically, my, my instinct would be to stake out a, you know, very defensible position on this. And so, for example, we could talk about how even in liberal Europe, they've got like a 20 week ban, you know, and surely that's something that like, I think is, you know, ought to be like a mainstream popular thing to do. Well, is that, is that are these 20 week bans that are, that are flat or 20 week bans with medical exceptions? Uh, so, per, you know, personally, I have always been in favor of uh, exceptions, um, but there are pro-life people who, you know, who the problem, I mean, we've talked about this before, probably years ago. Um, there are problems with allowing for exceptions. Um, one problem is that all you need is a doctor to say the life of the mother is at stake. And look, what does that really mean? How do you um, how do you quantify that or, or, or prove that? Another problem is that 
if you allow for exceptions on, let's say, rape, a rape exception, for example, um, it, it undermines the argument that every li- you know every life is precious, uh, you know the dignity of the unborn child that you know, and 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 so there are there are legitimate reasons or at least you know serious reasons why people uh, don't want to allow exceptions, but I've always felt like politics. This is you know this is not arguing like. This is an area where I would sort of divorce maybe like my own preference from politics, which is to say that I think politics is a very messy business by definition and carving out public policy is not perfect. And so I would allow exceptions because I think that it it, if you're going to get a broad consensus that um, that it gets us there and that it would save lives and and. Uh, it'd be an incre- certainly a, a big incremental gain, but see, that's my um, that's my bias toward comedy and uh, and persuasion. But there are probably, I'm sure, plenty of people who are pro lifers who are saying, "No, this is our moment." And in a negotiation, you ask for more than you think you're going to get, right? So if if we ask for something that sounds reasonable. We're going to get less because that's how negotiations go. So let's ask for a lot. I think if, you're, if, if persuasion is the name of the game, this Texas plan to sue everybody is not the way to go. I mean, there, this is so ripe for nasty, frivolous, punitive, harassing lawsuits. Uh, I mean, because there's no... There's no adult supervision on it. I mean, you could sue anybody, uh, and uh, and there's there's no there's no downside for the for the plaintiff in this. So it just seems like a way to really alienate the middle. Uh, and mind you, I mean, we you know, we look at Texas as this big conservative state. It's a it's a big bluing state. I mean, it's not going as it's not bluing as fast as Democrats would like. But there's a lot of population influx. It's a lot of college educated people coming in. The college educated people survey show are more pro choice than non college educated. So uh, it's I mean, especially you're really asking, depending on how you frame it. I mean, I think there's a way to frame it when you start asking questions a different way. People become more pro. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, depending obviously numbers can change depending on the framing, but it just as a general matter, the people coming into Texas are more inclined to abortion rights than the people who were there previously. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so you're now you're now instigating a culture war battle royale on turf, which I think for conservatives is a little shaky. Well, this is the kind that would accelerate the bluing trend. I mean, I'll just use also, I'll just use myself as a microcosm for them. I was very comfortable talking about Afghanistan because I know (laughs) I would have heard about Afghanistan. Okay. But because I'm somebody who has traditionally not gone on like say Fox news to preach to the choir, but I've gone on like CNN or MSNBC and kind of gone into the lion's den and tried to argue conservative positions that I could defend. You know, these things like what you're bringing up in Texas, it it becomes, it's very easy for the other, for the other side to say like, um, you don't want, you don't even think that women who've been, you know, raped or that they should even, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy for the other side to attack the pro-life cause when you, when the, you know, when you have something like this come down and again, like politics involves fighting and fighting over ideas and that's just the name of the business. It's not for sissies. Is that politically incorrect? I don't know. It's not for wimps. Also, maybe politically incorrect. Politics ain't politics ain't beanbag. It ain't beanbag, and 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 it is about fighting to a certain degree. Um, but then it, the question is like, do you want what turf do you want to be fighting on? Like, do you want the high ground? You know, do you want and and so, you know, there are ways to there are ways to go into. Uh, a mainstream media environment where most people do not share my values. There are, there are ways to go in 
and try to make a compelling argument. And some of the things happening right now make it like make that a harder thing to do, I would say. Um, well, why don't we why don't we shift gears um, uh, to Afghanistan? Um, Biden gave his speech this week, uh, predefined speech. Uh, I mean, I know. I mean, you you've not been the biggest imperialist in the world. <laughs> uh, you don't want to fight endless wars everywhere, uh, but you're very critical of Biden's handling of, of Afghanistan. Uh, do you think he has recovered it all politically by <clears throat> being unrelenting? You know, staking out his turf, sticking to it, and defending it. I think he's completely botched everything to do with it. I was against the withdrawal, but let's get past that. The execution of the withdrawal was horrible. He lied to us about so many things. Um, and then even his speech, <clears throat> where he talks about the buck stops here, but he also blames, uh, you know, the Afghanistan government blames Trump, blames, you know, the Afghan security forces. Um, it, it was not, it's, it's not, it's not the leader, it's not the leadership that, that we were hoping that Biden would get. And I have to say, you know, whether it's the abortion issue, um, where the left, if they follow your advice bill, and I think they will, the left is going <laughs> to scream bloody murder right now. Um, whether it's that issue or whether it's Biden's handling of Afghanistan, you know, it made it really made me really happy that I that I did not vote for Biden in the 2020 in November. And I think there's a problem for Biden, which is, according to that big Pew survey from a while back, you know, Biden won because he got, you know, some never Trumpers to win. I don't know if you saw the Ron Johnson comments. Did you see that hidden Ron Johnson video that came out? <clears throat> I didn't. So there's a hidden video of Ron Johnson basically explaining to a constituent that actually Donald Trump did lose the election. And he's making the point that like the Trump would have won Wisconsin, but there were a whole bunch of people. There were there were like tens of thousands of people who voted for other Republicans in Wisconsin, but did not vote for Trump. And Ron Johnson is explaining to this voter or this constituent, you know, actually Trump lost. And if Trump had just gotten the votes that other Republicans got in the state, he would have won. So like, there is a never Trump vote out there. They undervoted Trump in Wisconsin. And some of those people helped elect Joe Biden. And Joe Biden is going out of his way to alienate people like that, at least if I'm any bellwether of it. It's like, I mean, the last month. And, and Bill Kristol, who, as you know, has been a big, um, a big uh, Biden supporter, you know, basically uh, came out the other day and said that, like, he knows a lot of people who voted for Biden who wouldn't vote for who won't vote for him again now? Well, you know, go governing is hard and it's easier to put stitch together a disparate coalition when you're the opposition party, when you have to govern and make decisions and uh, make compromises, have trade offs, you know, uh, make hard calls, have some calls not work out well. All these things weaken a coalition. This is why presidents parties usually lose midterms because yeah. governing coalitions weaken. Uh, and uh, you know, I think if so, it, it, one, it would not be surprising at all if some of these votes do peel off. Yeah. And it is a bad midterm for Democrats for that for that reason. Um, uh, but wouldn't you but just listen, wouldn't you, if you're Biden, say it is very clear the reason I won the election, according to the data, is that like. People like Matt Lewis even though I didn't vote for Biden. <laughs> so people like Bill Crystal. Basically, it was, you know, if I'm remembering that that Pew survey or whatever, it was it was like 
Biden didn't win the presidency by juicing the Obama coalition or turning out, you know, minority groups or, or, or women or whatever you might think a Democrat would need to do to win. Like, that's not why he won. He won because he lost people, say, like married white men by a smaller percentage than most Democrats typically do. If you knew that, like if you knew that that was the reason you won the presidency, wouldn't you go out of your way to like make special overtures to keep that group, that coalition? I mean, I, I, you know, it's it's a very, 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 very fine line Biden has to walk here to try to keep the base satisfied and to, and to keep his hold on the swing. And when you have to make decision after decision after decision, and again, it's not, and you know, we said, we said this before, you know, you can criticize Biden for making this Afghanistan decision. You can say, we didn't have to make it. He could have just held back, but not deciding is deciding. It's Afghanistan wasn't static. And so staying in is a choice too. There's, there's no way to just not, be involved like you're in it you're in all sorts of things when you're president uh so it's just impossible to okay well let me ask you this let me ask you this then we have 900 troops in syria did biden did biden make a choice to be in syria is biden he's made a choice by not he's made a choice by not pulling out and and is that a big deal though does anybody not, does not anybody today know that? Nobody, not, nobody not today but if things flared up and if if 10 of those people got killed tomorrow then it would be a big deal you know i and i just don't know what the next day is going to bring uh so that th these are the things you, that you have to my point which is like i do think it was a solution in need of a problem in so many ways. Like if he, even if he had just postponed it for a year, let's just say, I'm not saying that would have fixed anything, but it, I don't know that this was like the top, like the first thing, the burner or whatever, like the, the, the most important thing that he needed. Like, so, okay, <clears throat> seven months, we're seven months in and now Joe Biden has given us the Taliban, ISIS K and Al Qaeda back. Mm -hmm. Good job. Seven months in, well, I mean, got those groups you, back. You, I mean, understand you're, you're giving a very, very pat and perhaps spun narrative there. But I grant you that could well be in the narrative in, in, in 2022. My point is the, the other timeline may have been Taliban offensive storming Afghanistan uh, and American troops being killed. <laughs> Uh, and you promised to get out. What are you waiting for? I mean, there's just there's just no perfect answer to it to very to intractable problems when you're president. Uh, so uh, I, again, I, I can't say definitively with where this is the least worst decision that you could have made. Right. But today, you know, I I have to go thoroughly read the story. But there's like a big piece in the Washington Post about you know, Biden attacking this Texas bill. We're not tech, you know, Texas mm -hmm. the, the, so the Supreme Court's. Yeah. You get it. Um, talking and he's talking about you know the constitutional right for an abortion or, or something to that effect. Is that what Biden should be doing if he's thinking about me being the difference between him being in the White House or not? Like, is that it, it, he doesn't seem like somebody who appreciates how he got elected president? Well, he was always. And the party has been forthrightly pro-choice for a long time. He, in whatever pro-life elements in Biden's record have existed, Biden clearly recalibrated that, got himself more square with the mainstream of the Democratic Party for the general election. You know, he didn't win with a lot of, you know, anti-abortion votes. I, I think some, I think, I mean, there's, there's always some diversity in anybody's coalition. Uh, but any, anyone who voted for Joe Biden knew full well what they're voting for in that regard. And so I, I don't think Biden's taking as big of a risk on that score. Afghanistan is different because I think there are those foreign policy hawkish never Trumpers. I mean, they may not be a huge part of the Biden coalition, but they're, they're, they're non-zero. And yeah. those, fo those folks are now displeased. Uh, abortion, I don't think he's taking as big of a, of a risk there, especially well, the because like, the Republicans thing. are taking the extreme position in what's going on with Texas. Well, with the Afghanistan thing, you were looking for things like competence, <clears throat> and kindness. 
he got into like an argument apparently with a or, or bristled at a gold star family well, I, I, let's, the other day. Let, let, let's be careful how we characterize these things. I mean, I I, I, well, I, I read the story, but we heard, think, we we heard the story from, and actually the story itself did didn't really didn't say to me that Biden was being angry or rude, but they were under. People understandably angry that their ch- their children have been killed. And no, the, this no, the story did suggest that he was being rude. That <clears throat> um, that he wanted to talk about his own son instead of. But the, but the, that's that's what Biden has always done. Has always talked about Bo as a way to show you know uh, sympathy and empathy. Bill, you and I know if somebody has a loss, you know, you know, if your dad just died, I wouldn't come to you and be like, you know, I know exactly how you feel, ma'am. I lost my dad. It, let's my dad in 2004. It really hit me. Yeah, like that's people, not how you people do do that. <laughs> it's, it's the exact thing you're not supposed to do. You are not supposed to do that. There are lots of that do that. Maybe it doesn't work for everybody. Maybe some people don't appreciate it. I think you're making it about yourself, but it's, it's, it's not, unusual and by and Mer- Bo, Bo the was, I Mer- Bo I was a veteran about this with Trump and I don't think you know I'm holding Biden to basically the same standard but my point though is without getting into two into the weeds on this one incident people thought that Biden would bring competence that's undermined by Afghanistan they thought he would bring you know, honesty, they lied to us so much throughout this, documented you know, multiple times. And they thought that he would bring a sort of a kindness and a decency and an affability. He's angry. Biden is now angry. If you watch those speeches, he's mad. He's mad. I th- I, I, I wouldn't say mad. I, I, I would say defiant. I think he is trying to show that he's unwavering. That he's not second guessing himself, uh, and I mean, you know, one person's mad is another person's strength. There's there, there there are some people out there saying, "Hell yeah, we should get the hell out of there." Thank God Joe Biden stuck to it and isn't listening to all all these naysayers. Um, and we don't know how Afghanistan's going to look one month, two months, three months from now. Uh, if if that's not top of mind. <clears throat> Plenty of people are going to say, "Hey, we got we got our we got our, our soldiers back. Great, let's move on to the next thing." And Biden didn't do anything to um, undermine the position well, that he took. You know, I, this is static, and, and and news cycles move on sometimes. Um, but he is down, right? His his fave unfaves. Oh, he's, are... he's definitely down. I mean, I, I there was some analysis before the. The airport bombing to suggest that was being driven more by COVID and the Delta variant spike than it was by Afghanistan. Uh, I think it's a little hard to separate these things. They're both happening at the same time. Uh, and to your point, Matt, to the extent that Biden is being charged with incompetence in Afghanistan, I think that spills over to everything else. If, if Biden is no longer seen as a competent administration, <clears throat> then it's hard to argue that Hey, he's doing all he could on COVID, and this Delta variant is well, the fault of unvaccinated Trumpers, not because Biden's not doing his due diligence. I agree with that. I think the one that's even more, the spillover is even worse, is the honesty thing. I mean, it was so clear that he lied to us about so many things in Afghanistan that it makes me wonder, like, can I, can I trust anything else? That they're telling us, you know what I mean. That to me is the greater danger that we start to lose faith in the veracity. And by the way, he was supposed to be the opposite of Trump, you know. And so this undercuts that. Uh, I, I don't uh, think. Trump. I mean, <clears throat> every president spins. <laughs> every president gives a favorable depiction of the decisions that they took. That is hardly unusual. Trump is a whole other, you know, strata of mendacity that Biden is nowhere close to. If you're going to say, well, Biden, Biden said this about when the, when the Kabul might fall. And now he's saying that, oh, this is, this was to be expected. Like, 
I'm not saying that's great, but that's pretty standard presidential spinning, not Trump level. He also said, line. we're not going to leave. We're not going to leave any Americans behind. <clears throat> and they did. Um, there's a lot of stuff. Well, wait, 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 been... wait, there's, there's no soldier left behind. You know, okay. You, you, well, you, usually that line is about soldiers. Uh, and the question is now, are there people behind who are dual citizens, people who are Afghan interpreters for us? Uh, that we, could, we couldn't get all, all of them out. I'm not saying it's good. Anyone who wants to get out has not gotten out. It's obviously not good. Uh, uh, and you certainly can, can charge Biden with being... Uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 like an Obama. If you if you uh, if you want to keep your plan, you know, you can keep your plan. Well, that didn't mention that some people might change their plans. I mean, if this you like is your doctor. Yeah, you can keep right, your doctor. Right. I mean, this is th this is more typical presidential spinning than outright lying. I see. I, I think you're being too. I, I will. I will agree with you that Trump is qualitative. You know, qualitatively. And quantitatively, but certainly qualitatively different. But I think it is wrong for you to um, to write off what what Obama said and what Biden said and just hand wave it away as well. They all do that. I think that's part of the way you get Trump. Well, I, and I don't think we should tolerate or accept. I mean, that was, you know, Obama doesn't get pinged for this as much by the mainstream media, I think because of liberal bias, but that has to be one of the greatest broken promises in political history. I mean, what a I, one, I wouldn't say that. I think that is far, I, I think that's far too hysterical a charge. Having said that, it hurt him. It unquestionably hurt him. I mean, I think political, you know, PolitiFact said it was like the, you know, the lie of the year, whatever it was. So it's not like it, it, he got away with it, but he got reelected, but it clearly hurt him in the midterms. Uh, and Biden might well be hurt by this, particularly if one of these people dies. Uh, so I, I'm not trying to suggest that these, these, the, that, it's small beer politically. Uh, I, but I do bristle at this as, oh, this is, I thought we weren't getting Trump. This is just like Trump. This is not just like Trump. <laughs> it may be a problem for Biden. It may be, and maybe worthy of criticism, but it's not Trump. Well, I agree that it's not that qualitatively Trump is worse, but Biden's raison d'etre is being the opposite of Trump. And that Im implies a lot of things. And I feel like Biden has not lived up to that promise of, of being that stark contrast to Trump that we hoped he would be. I, I don't think there's a lot of people there saying this is just like Trump. Everything that's happened in the past eight months, it's like Trump never left. I mean, this no, is I don't think people are saying that. I think what they're saying is frustration that like no matter who we elect, they uh, we can't we can't find someone Who's going to solve our problems? We're just jumping from the, you know, well, we go from one corrupt, you know, administration to another incompetent well, one. Well, you know, this happened. was the Jimmy Carter problem. This was the Bill Clinton problem. This was the Barack Obama problem. This is a Democratic problem because Democrats are held to higher standards than Republicans on a lot of these fronts because they sell themselves as being, you know, morally clean, more honest, more compassionate, more interested in the, in, in the, common person the common good and perfection is impossible uh mistakes happen trade-offs happen presidents spin um you're you're caught in difficult situations and it's hard to uh be a uh, hundred percent forthright without undercutting yourself uh yeah. and so you get dinged on these things so that's i agree i completely agree that we live in a fallen world and politics is messy and Bad stuff's going to have like you're going to have to deal with problems. It just seems like Biden has really <laughs> created a lot of them. I mean, uh, it, it, it doesn't feel like a return to normalcy. It doesn't feel like, <sighs> OK, finally, some time to not you know, like that promise of like, OK, now you can ex exhale 
has he has not lived up to that. And like Afghanistan is a debacle of his choosing, like in so many ways. And that's kind of not what I was hoping for, to be honest, you know? Well, uh, after after Trump, after the chaos of Trump, I will say this. Mm. I thank Biden that his speeches are always midday <laughs> because Trump would have done like a nine o'clock speech, PM speech, like a prime time thing, which would have impacted me personally. I don't like that. So thank you, Biden, for wanting to go to bed early and, and doing the. No, I will say Biden's always an hour, hour and a half late to everything he does. Um, but at least he's doing it in the afternoon. So I appreciate that. Uh, we probably should wrap. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we jump? <laughs> uh, I, I hope that I'm not. Do I seem bitter? Maybe I drank too much coffee. I mean, I don't know. You're, you didn't vote for the guy. What do you have to be bitter, I don't bitter about? Be, but I don't want to be like. You weren't betrayed. You didn't vote for him. Like, I don't want to be. I don't want to become the curmudgeon that Biden is slowly becoming. <laughs> I don't go from like nice, affable Biden to, you know, over caffeinated. But. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Usually right. you, a lot of times we do this and I feel like you, you, you bring me, you talk me down and that just didn't happen. <laughs> I'm not sure what I can, what I can do on the score today. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, your, your mood is not intrinsically linked with Biden's approval rating. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the madometer. <laughs> Is a thing, Bill. <laughs> I think it's possible Biden recovers from this. I mean, you know, I mean, every president has dips. Uh, every president has bad moments in their in, in, in their in their trajectories, uh, and to have a to, to hit a rough patch politically, you know, late in the first year, early second year, hardly unusual. Um, but uh, Biden does need to be better, way better than average, for Democrats to avoid a midterm. Loss. I mean, and, and even a better than average midget for Democrats would mean loss of both chambers of Congress. So they got to be particularly good uh, to avoid that problem. And so uh, looking at things today, it feels a lot more like a normal presidential trajectory. Mistakes happen, coalitions fray, um, hovering around 50 percent, a little bit under it right now. Uh, that's not going to be good enough. He needs a pretty big turnaround. It's uh, feeling more like a one turn. It's premature, Bill, but. It's feeling more like a one term, like a one term president to me. This well, isn't. But, a, but well, my argument is this: this is not indicative of a one term president. Plenty of two term presidents have moments like this. It like is, this? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Reagan and Lebanon, for Pete's sake. Reagan, Reagan, Reagan already went through a horrible recession in eighty two and had the Lebanon debacle in eighty three. Humiliating pullout in spring of eighty four. Wins with a massive landslide. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, Bill Clinton had a horrible first year. Joe Biden's no Ronald Reagan either, though. I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, well, you you don't know that yet. I mean, Reagan didn't look so much like Reagan in 1982. Um, uh, you know, Plus, uh, Reagan Bill, had been, you know, laying the groundwork with the Fed <laughs> um, for the economic comeback. It seems to me like the opposite. The opposite groundwork has been laid. Maybe we'll be maybe I'll be proven wrong, but it just it seems more likely to me that things. But again, hey, look, your point, your point, your point is we see through a glass darkly and you might have in, in 1982, uh, you know, you might not have you wouldn't have predicted 49 states. Right. In well, 1984, so, I mean, not 82. Certainly not. I mean, you know, Bill Clinton had you know, a failed stimulus BTU tax. Uh, have the controversial tax hike, uh, have the gays in the military, uh, don't ask, don't tell debacle. Uh, you know, he, he was trending down, uh, in that first year, uh, and, and, a, t and a terrible 94 midterm. Uh, Barack Obama hit the skids by March 2010. The economy had not recovered despite the stimulus. Uh, the it beer summer was, me, was, was a mess. Uh, and he signed Ob Obamacare uh, on, on the, on the dip. You know, it was not, a, it was not a victory lap moment for him. And also terrible midterm. Yeah. Still recovered. I, I, look, I, I can't quantify this. It's undocumented. There's no way to prove it, but I just, it felt like Bill Clinton had energy and the zeitgeist was with him in a lot of ways. And, and the same thing with Obama. Like, 
excitement, energy. Like after the ninety four feels like Jimmy Carter. After the ninety four midterm, people were saying, "Is the presidency still relevant?" And Bill had to come out and say, "The president is still relevant." It was humiliating. He seems small, uh, but the economy turned around in time. Uh, so, I mean, so I would not extrapolate out to 2024 from this. I do think it makes for a very narrow window to turn things around for 2022. Uh, cause you're already, you, you need two things to happen. You need your party unified and the other party disunified. Now, the other party is unified. That might still happen. I don't think the Republicans are super locked up right now. But you're definitely seeing Democrats more willing to criticize Biden uh, on both the left and the right, be impatient, demand this, demand that. Um, that that dynamic, that might be harder to get, put that toothpaste back in the tube for 2022. I think a lot of things have to go right if, if that's going to happen. All right. I feel a little better now. OK, Your work <laughs> yeah. is done. because Republicans will do better in the midterms. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. It was just I just need a little more bill share. I don't All know. Right. What to say. All right. All right. Um, so we're not going to DM Zoom tomorrow. I might I might do a Zoom myself. If you don't mind. Cool. Uh, okay. I might do solo Zoom. For, uh, so be, be, if you're on my Patreon supporter list, I'll send out an announcement with the details. Uh, otherwise, we'll talk next week. We'll talk next week. See and, you then. Anything to plug? Uh, let's see. Well, I did. I talked to Dan Darling, who was the um, <clears throat> fired by the National Religious Broadcasters for his pro vaccine stance. We had a really good podcast. And uh, I'm supposed to talk to David French on Friday. We'll see, uh, you know, knock on wood, but hopefully we'll have a good conversation, too. How about you, Bill? Um, uh, I check out my stuff at the monthly. Say hi, Laz. Um, I got so my, my Texas piece is up. My I got a piece about Jerome Powell and whether he should be renominated at the Fed. That's also up at the monthly. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll talk to you next week. All right. See you all later. Bye bye. Nice.